Hello, Booktube, uh, and welcome back to your Daily Penguin. Uh, this is our tour through my Penguin Classic wall, and uh, we had a brief period where we were dealing with Russians, but that period seems to be over for now. Uh, I can't imagine any major Russian work of literature that I might have missed. Uh, but in the meantime, we ha are starting to bounce around again, and that's going to happen in the course of this Penguin Classic waddle. We're gonna we're gonna bounce around sometimes. Sometimes we'll hit threads, other times not. Uh, the goal, one of my goals of this, in addition to sharing these books that have meant so much to me uh, with all of you, is to get a grasp on this Penguin Wall to make it to make it a little less chaotic. So I am noting all of these bouncing arounds, and I'm pulling doubles and even triples off the shelves. I'm reorganizing things. If I pull a penguin off the shelf and I, I look at it and I realize, boy, I, I don't like this edition and I don't like this work. I don't know why I have this. Well, then it's not going back on the shelf until I someday later decide that I want it. No, I, no, I'm, I'm pruning as I go and rearranging. Uh, it's a great, it's a great pleasure, but, uh, even finding works that that don't hold their weight, that never have held their weight, that I've had only because they're Penguin Classics, which is really bad. That is a really bad reason to have a book. I am not a collector of books, not in the, <laughs> I am obviously an accumulator of books, but I'm not a collector in the sense of caring about editions or uh, issues or whatever. And, and so mere, or complete sets in this case. So m having a book merely because it's a Penguin Classic is a terrible idea. Uh, and I've been finding that sometimes, I mean, it's natural, sometimes I would go to a used bookstore and I would see a, a batch of Penguin Classics and I would just grab them all. Uh, that's an understandable reflex at the time that it's happening, but it's a lot less forgivable to just pile them on shelves without examining them. Especially when I know from how much time I spend at that bookshelf, just wandering around, just talking with those books and consulting with them, I know the ones that I go to and the ones that I don't. So that's been helpful, uh, very, very helpful, and that's going to continue so that I'm hoping that by the end of this Penguin Classic tour, however long it lasts, um, my Penguin Classic wall will be pristine, be in perfect shape. That's, uh, I think, the goal of everybody. <laughs> I don't know that we ever reach it. But today's Penguin Classic is uh, not in danger. <laughs> it's not in danger at all. It's a it's a remarkable volume. Valuable in the way that we've seen some Penguin Classics are. This is uh, The Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia by the great Sir Philip Sidney. Uh, and it's a mess. <laughs> Textually speaking, it's a mess. Uh, its provenance is uh, crippled by multiple editions so that you do you uh, a beginner, a raw beginner to this book, just would not know what's what, what's the real Arcadia, what's the one to start with. And the, one of the most amazing things about this book, uh, it's, a, it's a long uh, romance by Sir Philip Sidney, the, the, the very ideal of an Elizabethan courtier, someone who could, who could do it all, turn a fine phrase, present a fine leg, uh, dance the latest dance, uh, go to war, a duel, uh, expouse uh, extemporaneous poetry, and write long, serious works of poetry in many different genres. Uh, a sort of finished courtier who uh, excelled in all the courtier's arts except one, which was being a courtier to the queen. Uh, Sidney had a, a, a fiery temper after his own manner and was very fond of speaking his own mind, and that didn't work with Queen Elizabeth I. That didn't always work with her. You had to speak her mind. You had to sound like you were being very forthright, but what came out of your mouth had to be something that she thought. And so his relationships with her were sometimes rocky, and sometimes, uh, uh, one time in particular, he had to retire from court. He had to make himself scarce, because that was the first step. Once you knew that you had outraged the queen, you had better use the better part of valor and go to your country estates and not show up at court. Because if that got worse, her ire is bad enough because she was very good with uh, 
forthrights quips herself and you wouldn't want to be the butt of one of those because it would be immortal we, you would still we would still be talking about it 500 years later um but that was the first step if you continue to show up if you continue to be underfoot and in her face so to speak in 20th century parlance after she had jostled with you then she could do much worse so sydney uh failed at being a courtier in only that way uh, but the um, the most remarkable thing about this book, in a way, in a meta in a meta sense, uh, is that there would be newcomers to it. Because for hundreds of years, this was an absolute axiomatic work. It was known to every literate person. It was known in great detail. It's it's basically the story of a, a king who gets a terrible terrible prophecy. He he seeks in a very unchristian way he seeks to get a prophecy about the future and the prophecy that he gets is a whammy just every single horrible thing that you could imagine shy of death was going to come his way and the the the, uh, the oracle makes sure to tell him it's all going to happen in the next year so he goes into into disguise he and his queen and his daughters go into disguise as shepherds uh, and the the story complicates because two princes very randy amorous princes get word of that and the the king in exile the, the disguised king the king who is disguised as a shepherd has entrusted the safety the virginity of his daughters to uh another shepherd to uh, to other rustics and the the whole goal is for in their case is to prevent suitors uh, and now you have two suitors who are as determined as they could be, and they themselves take on disguises, and the story goes on from there in just one extrapolation after another. And I think it would be difficult now, in 2020, unimaginable year 2020, to really uh, get across how much this meant to its original readers, uh, not just as a pattern of romance, but also as a treasure trove, a house of literature. The, the writing here, the, the English does things that are unbelievable, just unbelievably complex, so close to what Latin can do that there's no meaningful difference. And commentators have pointed out from Sydney's day to this that the number of people, the number of writers in English who can manage this, much less manage it for hundreds of pages, is very small. You can count them on two hands. Uh, and that was esteemed in a way that is not esteemed anymore, certainly in poetry, it's not esteemed anymore. Uh, but the reason that I say that this is a, a mess, provenance-wise, is because it, it had two different editions, and those two editions became four editions, and that is a headache. All four of those editions have their own rabid partisans saying this is the real Arcadia and this is the best Arcadia and you just have to Nobody in the 21st century wants to read all of those different Ur texts obviously no one wants to read Sydney at all anymore. Sydney has disappeared That's the like I mentioned. That's one of the strangest things about this book is that it can have new readers Children are not taught this in school anymore. They're not given little children's versions of it or pressies of it the, the adults are not using this as a lingua franca anymore. They haven't in, in centuries. And that's amazing, because this had a long, long run as one of the most popular books in the world. I don't know what to think about runs like that. I respect them. Uh, and I, I agree with critics who say, with the famous, the famous dictum, uh, is that uh, many books are unjustly forgotten, but no book is unjustly remembered. Uh, and the, the uh, sentiment underneath that is a little bit heartless. It's a little bit Darwinian, which is that a, a book can be justly remembered for a long time and then something in the zeitgeist can shift and all of a sudden it's forgotten. We've seen some of those books here already, including a book uh, that, that was hugely indebted to Philip Sidney, uh, The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer. Sydney was was well known to all the literary and uh, intellectual figures of his day. He was young. He was fairly handsome. Uh, the portraits that we have of him tactfully omit his smallpox scars, 
Uh, but from what we can gather, they were relatively minor. So they would have given his the skin, especially on the bridge of his nose, a kind of porous look that the portrait painters very much do not include any more than they include them in the faces of our founding fathers here in America. But it could be much worse, right? I, I don't know how much any, I shouldn't say right, I don't know how much any of you know about smallpox, but it could be much worse. There were, it was easily possible if you had smallpox, even as a child, it was easily possible for the scars left behind to be so bad that you could not show your face in public. So by the standard of his day, Sidney was attractive and well-spoken, very charismatic, very entertaining to spend time with. And as a result, he knew everybody, <laughs> absolutely everybody. Uh, he, he was, uh, for instance, a friend of someone who just came up on this channel a little while ago, Giordano Bruno, dedicated a couple of books to him. And they spent, they spent a good deal of time in quiet, intimate, personal contact, just talking with each other about books and the, the, the nature of the times and whatnot. Uh, and Sidney's family was extremely well connected. They were, they were, among other things, extremely well connected to the Dudley family. And his sister, Mary, was every bit as intelligent as he was, every bit as inventive as he was, every bit as creative, every bit as glowing in personal conversation. Uh, married well and became the Countess of Pembroke. <laughs> you might be able to see where some of this is going. And she had a country estate. And it was at that country estate in 1580 that, that Sidney... Uh, probably wrote most of, of the book, the o old Arcadia, in old Arcadia. Uh, and he wrote it with her, not in the sense of a formal collaboration as we would understand it today, but talking with her about every single thing about it, and then hurrying off to write what they had talked about while he was still all aglow with creativity, and often sending her the pages in his own hand as they were being written. Now, the thing that, that some literary critics, especially of a more uh, Oxbridge sexist type in the 20th century, have stopped the whole image there. They've said, oh, okay, that, so that's what he did. We, I mean, we, we know that he did that because he wrote, le we have letters of his saying that he did that, and well, there's no reason why he would lie about it. And they don't go any further, and of course they should, because you don't do that just for a mute reading audience, you do that for a collaborator. It's obvious that the two of them collaborated on the book. Uh, uh, Mary Sidney, uh, Mary Mary Herbert, <laughs> in her married name, the Countess of Pembroke, had a literary output of her own and was a literary patron of her own. It, there's there's no reason to, to discount her involvement with that book. Uh, and that original book, or something close to it, was uh, was what Sidney fiddled with in the early 1580s. He was, he was, it obviously stuck with him. It nagged at him. He wanted to keep working on it and maybe make it into different things. It's, a, in my opinion, a pure evocation of the, the time waste factor of the courtier's life. I think it's clear from Sidney's reactions to this book, from his thoughts about this book in the 1580s, the early 1580s, uh, that he was really first and foremost a writer. And not any of these other things that he was forced to do. I mean, getting into, you know, want, getting into a, a loud brawling fight with Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, and wanting to 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 duel with him, <laughs> things like that, over questions of the day, but also for courtier reasons. I mean, Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth I had to step in and stop that duel from happening. Or Oxford would certainly have killed Sidney. I mean, Oxford was nothing to trifle with in a duel, and Sidney was popinjay. Uh, and then who knows what. What would, what would have happened to any of his literary endeavors. One way or another, uh, an, an edition was forming under Sidney's hands in the early, in the early 1580s that was uh, more complicated than the one that he'd originally written at Wilton, the, the one that he'd originally written in 1580 with his sister. Uh, and then he died in the Netherlands. He was a militant Protestant. He was fighting in the Protestant cause. He was shot in the leg and w could have been saved in 20 minutes in an emergency room in the 20th century. But instead, he got gangrene. And that is a, that is a slow, horrible, agonizing death. And it took him a long time to die, many weeks to die. And finally he did in 1586. And this work 
was sort of hanging there. And in 1590, an edition came out of the old, of the old Arcadia that was that was sort of. Uh, I mean, in addition to that, the first version of his had circulated among friends, and the the this early edition was it. But then in 1593, his sister came out with a, a very lavish, expensive edition that included bits and pieces of, of the earlier work that had not seen print and, a newer, and newer conclusions, newer bridge work material and stuff like that uh, to, to stop the work from ending in mid-scene, which it had done. Uh, and she had help, and there were later editions. And it was only in the early 20th century that the, that the original Old Arcadia was finally found, codified, and printed. So now you have, at the very least, two different editions of this work. You have Philip Sidney's Old Arcadia, and you have the Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia that she did in 1593. We'll never really know why she came out with that version. It could be that she was possessive of her brother's memory. She never quite got over the loss of him. It could also be that she was, in her own way, possessive of her own literary ability, of a thing that she viewed probably rightly as it much hers as his. Uh, but one way or another, it's presented uh, since you know it, in the early 20th century. It's presented readers with uh, a horrible choice: which of the Arcadias, which of Sir Philip Sidney's Arcadias, do you read? Sorry. Don't have the lungs to yell over a siren. Uh, and yelling over jackhammers is bad enough. <laughs> and and it's uh, the tragedy attending this book here, and it's not, I'm not saying that anybody's to blame for it, but the tragedy attending this book is that that horrible choice, which is, is bad enough to sink a classic right there, that you have two different versions of this book, at least. There are two other versions that you could easily point to as thing, the, the arcade that you should read. But if we concentrate just on those two, the one written by Philip Sidney, the one cobbled together by Mary Sidney, then you, you present the readers with, a hor with readers with a horrible choice of which do you read. And the, the tragedy of this book is that that horrible choice arrived right when no one cared. <laughs> when no one would, would, have wanted, would have cared to read it anyway. If this weren't taught in schools, it would be completely dead. It would be as gone as Confessio Amantis or the, the, the uh, Romance of the Rose. These, these things, that the Romance of the Rose was once the most popular book in the Western world. Everybody knew it. Everybody who read had a copy. Everybody who read could quote from it and knew every, every nuance of it. It's completely gone now, except in scholarly circles. And that's what's happened to the Arcadia, whether it's the old Arcadia or the Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia or any other Arcadia. This has all just moved into the province of scholars. It's scholars who pick this apart. It's scholars who say how great it is or who really appreciate it. The general all-purpose reader, generally speaking, can't be induced to read this book. They might be forced to encounter it in school, but otherwise, no. And I think that's a shame. Of course, I think that's a shame. But uh, I also wonder, in cases like this, what's going on there and it's a shame yes because i've enjoyed this book i've read i've read i've read it many times and i always get something out of it i always love getting lost not only in its weird worlds but in its incredibly uh formidable english i mean sydney was was great in many different things his his sonnets are are amazing to read uh but here i believe is the full fruit of his literary ability that that at its peak in his lifetime i i this is inexhaustible for me like the fairy queen like orlando furioso like these books that penguin has brought out mercifully in 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 these volumes but that don't exist in the public reading sphere they don't exist in the republic of letters anymore no one reads them which is the only kind of immortality that Sidney would have wanted this thing to have it's the only kind of immortality that ariosto would have wanted his book to have or anybody else who is do people read it do people pick it up and read it? I don't. None of these people would have cared that scholars read it, but unfortunately, scholars are the only people who read this book now. And I always wonder when that happens, why that, why that happens, and whether or not there is any part of that process that is, in fact, a verdict against the book. 
I don't know, a part of me feels like that's unfair. It seems unfair to expect any author to write a book that can last forever. So, you know, the fact that no author can foresee shifts in taste, shifts in, in the literary landscape, shouldn't be held against them. Uh, but on the other hand, I, I, when I see that definitely happen, that has certainly happened in this case, I, then I, I always ask myself a whole host of questions as to why. I, I view that as a great anecdote to being the kind of reductionist snob who doesn't ask those questions, who doesn't wonder why these things are never read anymore, but just contents himself with saying, everybody's stupid, I liked it, it should still be read. It isn't, and, you know, uh, there are a million serious readers in the world, not all one million of them can be wrong at the same time in the exact same way. So this book is, I won't say justly forgotten, <laughs> but uh, but it is, it is nevertheless not just a fad, it's gone. And so I don't know what to do with... Uh, with the recommendation part of your Daily Penguin. Uh, it feels like a betrayal of Philip and Mary Sidney not to recommend this, <laughs> but I'm perfectly, I'm perfectly willing to admit that a large part of your literary receptivity has been sculpted by your education, by your literary landscape, by the literary zeitgeist around you in your lifetime. A large part of that is there and, and, uh, and therefore a large part of it even in the best of readers was not shaped by themselves so i wonder how many readers even dedicated readers could pick this up and just enjoy it not for not i don't wonder that for snobbish reasons it's just it's totally different than a lot of what you would have been exposed to and you haven't been exposed to this nor ever taught by any patient teacher how to read it usually so I don't know. I, I, of course I recommend The Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia or Old Arcadia by, by Philip Sidney. It's wrong to say that Old Arcadia is written by Philip Sidney alone. Like I mentioned, it was written in daily, enthusiastic collaboration with his sister. Uh, this is more of a sort of a crazy quilt thing where she tries to stitch together a couple of different what were already emerging as a couple of different textual traditions with varying degrees of success. I'm perfectly willing to admit that. The, the, a critic that we've seen on the Daily Penguin, uh, William Hazlitt, was also willing to point that out. And a couple of others have been too, that, that this doesn't quite work. And that the original doesn't quite work either. It's, it's just a shame that Philip Sidney died in 1586. It's a shame that he didn't go on to live well into the Jacobean era. And, work on this book until he had a version that he was finished with. Can you only imagine a first folio style uh, airs and fanfares finished definitive version of this from Sidney's own hand with his sister cheering him on and being the first to applaud. It's, it's amazing. It would have evolved, I think, over decades under his hand until it became something even more special than what it is. So, of course, I recommend it to you, but I don't for most of you, I don't imagine that you will enjoy it. And I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> so, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to uh, wrap it up there with, this is, I, I know, a rather inconclusive version of I View Daily Penguin. This is Arcadia. This is Philip Sidney at, at his most epic. And if you want to give it a try, the Penguin Edition, the Penguin Edition is by, is edited with introduction by Maurice Evans. And it's very good. It will give you everything that you need to know. Uh, I believe that Penguin also makes a separate, or did once upon a time, make a separate edition of the the one, the, the old Arcadia that was first published in the early 20th century. I believe they do that. I think it's called the old Arcadia. I don't know that I have it. I don't think we'll be visiting Philip Sidney again. Uh, but I think they do, and you could, if you really wanted, you could get both of those and compare the two of them, read them back to back. Uh, I don't know how much good it would do you. You won't find any other fellow, any other Sydney, any other Arcadia fans of Sydney. Any fans that Sydney has today are for his admittedly great defensive posy and his his sonnets, but not not this. <laughs> so, so I'm going to wrap this up for now. Uh, that is your daily penguin. We'll see what we encounter tomorrow. Maybe we'll be back to the Russians. Uh, but one way or another, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, but I'll see you soon. Thank you, Book Two.